Well, good morning, Riverside Online. It is so good to have you joining us this morning. We built a really awesome community here online over the last several months. Uh, if you could, just go ahead and drop your name down below. Just say good morning in the comment section. What's one way God has blessed you this week? Just whatever you have going on, just drop it down in the comment section. We'd love to hear from you. Um, guys, again, we've been able to build this great online community, but um, we're living out as well several of our church's values through these services of just getting into God's Word. And Pastor Andrew, here in just a minute, is going to dive in to the book of Revelation again. And he's just been preaching an awesome series. So I just can't wait to hear what it is that he has to say today um, and what God wants to speak through him, through God's Word. And uh, so, again, if you have any distractions, anything around you, we just encourage you to put that away, just dive into God's word during this time. Uh, and then we're also here in just a second gonna get into some worship. And it's so easy, I think, to when, when we're worshiping, just to focus on the words that are on the screen or just kind of daze off a little bit. It's Sunday morning, we're all tired. But I just encourage you guys, this is just a great time to reflect on God. What, what God has done for us on the cross and the way that he loves us just so, so much. So I just encourage you again, just, just spend this time to focus on the Lord, what the Holy Spirit has to say to you today. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we just, again, we, we love you so much. And um, God, we all have a million things going on right now in the world and a million things going on in our week. And um, it's so easy not to focus on you even during the, the next hour. God, I just pray, though, that we can dedicate this hour to you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through Andrew. I pray that the um, as, as we're going to engage in worship, Lord, that we would engage with you, God, and not just, again, just dazing off, Lord. We just pray, ultimately, that each home right now that is watching in their living room or wherever they are, that uh, your Holy Spirit would be with each person watching right now, Lord. You would speak to them greatly. God, we just love you so much and we dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name, amen. Hey church, uh, this is just an extra little video we had added into the service and everything this weekend just to uh, address some of the things that um, we're continuing to follow as we continue to adapt to what life looks like, as we continue to adapt when um, COVID numbers spike in our county and different things like that. Um, we know that there are a lot of awesome people who are doing their best to, to work with that and everything. And um, part of everything we've been doing has been wanting to express the love and the grace of Jesus Christ and to show we care about people and their safety as well. So uh, it was just announced uh, at the end of last week that there will be a two-week freeze that is going on where uh, Oregon, for the most part, is kind of going back into a pseudo-quarantine kind of kind of time for two weeks to try to prevent spikes from happening with COVID-19. And so um, as a result, uh, the way that impacts the church is um, gatherings are going to be down to 25 is what the limit is going to be for a couple weeks. So that's going to be two Sundays. Um, so it's planned. And right now to lift on December 3rd, and it's going to start Wednesday, November 18th. So I just want to let you know that our leadership is talking about what we're going to do specifically with that and everything, um, and that we, you know, have just kind of had this particular uh, presence where we're just being willing to pivot and everything. Uh, one thing we want you to know is that regardless of how we pivot for these kinds of things, uh, the thing that is most important is that in one way or another, the gospel of Jesus Christ is stated. It is given hope and love and everything is given. Part of that is by um, 
being sensitive to what those in authority are having us do right now, knowing that it is so that we can express love and safety to other people. Because uh, wherever you're coming from, you may be thinking it's very real. You may think it's not very real. There's so many different opinions that have been surrounded with this virus and all the things attached with it. But the reality is, regardless of how you think or you feel about that, uh, as the church, it is our responsibility to show love to other people. And we are to do that regardless of what we feel. And part of the way we can genuinely just tell people we care about them and that we love them and we care about their safety is by um, being attentive to these rules and everything. And also just showing people that we care about them and our community in that way. So I just want to update you that that's um, what the next couple of weeks are looking like. Um, and so we are going to kind of talk to our leadership and we'll have some updates for you about uh, what we're going to do with that uh in the week to come. Uh, we're going to still, no matter what happens, we're still doing online on Sundays. So know that no matter what else, you can always tune in and connect with us there. And we'll give you updates about um, uh, how we might do in-person services for the next couple of weeks and everything. Um, and just always want to encourage you that if you would feel more comfortable staying home, if it would, uh, for your safety and your health and your family of things like that, that that's always an option for you. That is always an option for you to be able to do. And um, connecting with us and tuning with us online is a great way to do that. We are operating in such a way where online and digital ministry isn't just a tool. It's actually a mission field. It's a mission field where we can reach people we would never reach um, in any other way. And it's a way that you can connect, whether you're out of town, whether you're not ready to come back yet, you're still part of the family, whether you're online or whether you are in person and everything. So just wanted to give you a quick update with that um, so that you are aware of what's going on and make sure to check your inboxes and um, check social media to stay up to date with what we are doing. If you're not a part of our mailing list, um, just uh, give us a call at 541-942-7126 and you can give us your um, information and we can make sure that you're on our e mailing list to get emails and everything. You could also just send a email to CG Riverside Church at hotmail.com and just say you want to get added to the list and everything. That's a great way to be able to do that. So just wanted to update you church. Just wanted you to know that um, we're, we're looking into that and we will keep you guys updated with what we do. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for uh, just continuing to share the love of Jesus Christ in everything that you do. Uh, be blessed church. We'll continue with our service now. It was my cross you bore So I could live In the freedom you died for And now my life is yours And I will sing Of your goodness forevermore Worthy Jesus, you deserve the praise. 
was so awesome to get to be able to worship God through music, have him communicate his heart to us through the arts. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Andrew. I'm so glad you're joining us today. And I have just a couple quick updates for you to kind of let you know what's going on in the life of the church, which is great if you're a member of our church. It's great if you're just a guest and want to kind of know what we're about. Um, we're really glad you're here. I just want to have a quick update before we get into the message portion of our service today. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that um, if you are new to Riverside, if you're a part of the Riverside family, but you're maybe just kind of want to get more involved, know what's going on, be a part of what we're doing here, uh, we invite you to get involved. A couple of great ways to do that is to join a group or to serve. Joining a group is where you get an opportunity to uh, meet with people weekly in their homes, to, to pray together, to go over the Bible together, to learn more about Jesus together, and uh, get encouragement and community. Uh, the other way is by serving. One of the things that we do is we acknowledge that God has called us out of a life of brokenness and into a life where we get to share his healing and goodness with other people. So we invite you to be a part of that. Join a group or serve. If you're interested in doing that, uh, you can call the number below or send us an email at the email below as well. We also want to give you an opportunity to be able to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. That's a biblical concept where we give part of what we've been given, uh, financially back to God. We acknowledge that we are stewards of what God has given us, and he is the one who has given us our jobs and all these different things. And so we give back to him as a form of worship. And uh, when he blesses us, we try to bless others. And so there's several ways that you can do that. One is to give in person, either at our Sunday ser in-person services on Sunday or during the week. We are open Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 to noon. You can drop it off then. You can also mail it in to 1255 South River Road. That's another really great way to be able to do it. Uh, the other option is you can just text the word GIVE to 541-250-3211. That'll walk you through the process and you'll be able to do it from there. Uh, the other option is to give online. Go to our website, riversidechurchofgod.com, and there's a Give tab that'll walk you through it that way as well. So there's several opportunities to be able to do that, and uh, it's not just giving to an organization for the heck of it. It's not just giving for the sake of getting a write-off on your taxes. It's actually giving what God has given us to spread the gospel around the world. So this is a really awesome opportunity that God has given us to trust him with our finances, support the gospel around the world, and to uh, just trust him more. So uh, we invite you to do that today in uh, whichever way you would like to, and uh, invite you to uh, uh, tune in for this little video clip here that's going to get us into the sermon today. The fortress is taken. It is over. You said this fortress would never fall while your men defend it. They still defend it. They have died defending it. What can men do against such reckless hate? Ride out with me. Ride out and meet with me. For death and glory. For Rohan. For your people. The sun is rising. Look to my coming at first sight on the fifth day. At dawn. Look to the east. Stands alone. Not alone. Go hit him!
We all long for the day where we want to see good triumph over evil, the day when all evil has ceased to exist from the earth. In fact, this very storyline of the battle between good and evil and the hope for good's ultimate victory has been a story that mankind has told since the very beginning of history. We see again and again in the stories we tell each other, in the movies we watch, in the books that we read, that there is a battle between good and evil that we long to see come to a conclusion with good being victorious. In this movie clip that we just watched in our service, we saw one of the final scenes in The Two Towers, the the second of the Lord of the Rings trilogy that was originally written by J.R. Tolkien back in the beginning of the 20th century. And what Tolkien does in his writing is so beautiful because Tolkien was a Christian and Tolkien embedded deep spiritual imagery into his writings. And in this clip we just saw, it's the Battle of Helm's Deep and the monstrous forces of evil are besieging the castle and the forces of good seem to think that they've lost all hope. They begin to realize that the battle seems to be lost, but they can still buy enough time for some of the people to run away and get saved. So they rally their forces and they go out into what seems like certain defeat in order to save the others. And they begin to battle, and as they're battling, the sun begins to shine over the crest of the mountain. And as they look up on the hill, they see a rider dressed in white, a symbol of hope, a symbol that maybe evil will not win. This rider is Gandalf, one of the heroes, and he comes bringing reinforcements who ride down the hill and vanquish the forces of evil, saving our heroes. What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture of the forces of good coming in when it seems as all hope is lost, winning the ultimate victory for good over evil. And what I love about this clip is it communicates something about the stories we tell ourselves and something the Bible wants to communicate to us as well. The only thing that gave the people in the scene hope was the knowledge that the great rider was going to show up and save the day. And that's a reality that isn't true for the heroes in our fictional story, but is true for us in our stories in our life. Because the reality is is that knowing how good will triumph over evil will give us hope in our present circumstances. Knowing how Jesus is going to do away with evil, how Jesus is going to win the ultimate victory, will give us hope to fight the battle in the present. And that's what we're going to be talking about today as we're going towards the end of Revelation, chapters 17 through 20, which we're going to look at today, we actually see what evil's true destiny is, and what it looks like when Christ wins the ultimate victory over evil. So here's what we're going to do today. As we've been doing with this series, we're not looking at little nitpicky, getting lost in the weeds kind of things. We're looking at general themes to see what it says about evil, good, and hope. So we're going to look at this new figure that we meet called Babylon. We're going to see what the destiny of evil actually is. And ultimately, we're going to spend some time looking at the victory of the Lamb, the great rider who shows up and vanquishes evil once and for all. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 17 today, starting in verse 1. And we're going to bounce around a little bit, but we're going to start in chapter 17 here. The writer opens up and says, One of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. We're going to get into that imagery in a minute. The angel shows up after John has seen brokenness in the world. He's seen the devil trying to manipulate and distract people. He's seen people experience profound brokenness. An angel shows up and says, come and see what evil's destiny really is. Come and see the judgment of evil. And when we see this word judgment, we don't really like it. It makes us feel awkward, uncomfortable, makes us feel a little guilty sometimes. But this idea of judgment needs to be looked at through the lenses of the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ took the judgment we should have received on our behalf. He took our sin, the sin we meant to be punished for, the sin that was going to hurt us, kill us, condemn us, keep us separated from God. Jesus took that on the cross so that you and I 
no longer have to be judged on behalf of the wrong we've done. Jesus covers over it. It says in the Bible that we are made right in the sight of God because of Jesus' righteousness. Judgment passes over those who are found in Jesus. This idea of judgment is God showing up to make all wrongs right, making every sad and terrible thing become untrue. That's what this concept of judgment is. So from the beginning, in the midst of the brokenness, in the midst of the pain, as John has seen pain after pain after pain over the last several chapters, the angel shows up to say, Jesus knows where you're at and Jesus will bring an end to the pain. Some of you need to hear that today. Whatever your brokenness is, whatever you're struggling with in your life, the anxiety that seems to deafen you, the, the, the things in your life that seem to keep you from wanting to go on. We'll say again and again and again in this sermon, evil's days are numbered. Jesus is going to come and make every wrong thing right. And that's the hope that we hold. Verse 2, the kings of the world have committed adultery with this prostitute. And the people who belong to her have been made drunk with the wine of her immorality. After the angel says this, it says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. A symbol to say, I got a vision from this, from this angel, and this is what I saw. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and in scarlet and adorned with jewelry and pearls holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and of earth's abominations. And then the angel begins to give some context. In verse 15, the angel says to me, the waters, this image of water that we saw earlier that the prostitute sits on, and ruling represents masses of people of every nation and language. But what is, what is this woman, Babylon? The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So we look at this. It's full of intense imagery. Prostitutes and drunkenness and great seas that they go on. What is this all about? Like the rest of Revelation, this is symbolic. Last week we saw that the devil uses these beasts, these systems of the world to bring about his darkness, to bring about his deceit, his lies in the world. And if the beasts represent the things the devil uses to lead people astray, Babylon represents the culture that chooses lies and selfishness over God. And this is a reference way back to a, a city of the nation of Babylon, but even further back than that, this reference to the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. Humanity at one point all spoke the same language, and they decided that they were going to be the coolest thing. They decided they didn't need God. They, in fact, were gods, and they were going to build a giant tower up to God himself. They built a city, a city which was their source of hope, a city which was their ultimate thing that they lived for, a city devoid of God. And so the symbol of Babylon is a symbol that represents what individuals, families, cities, cultures, nations tend to do. When we take God out of the equation, when we decide that we're going to choose our own ways, we're going to define what is our ultimate on our own rather than let God define it, we slip into selfishness and lies, and it begins to erode who we are. In fact, this is the original lie that humanity was fed. In the garden, God created a world of flourishing, and the serpent shows up and says, Does God's raise really the best way? Does God really have your best interest at heart? Does God really care? I think you would do a better job of defining what is good and right for your life. And we see from human history, from the Bible, from our own lives, that when we decide to go our own way and define what is best for our lives, when we decide to choose the path of selfishness, when we buy into the lie that God doesn't care and we can do it better, our lives turn into a wreck. Sure, we might be dressed in the finest clothes. We might be living the high life. We might be feeling like we're living life and living it well. But ultimately, we end up empty. We end up hurting the people near us. We might be living the high life, but we might be doing it alone. And ultimately, our souls and our hearts begin to erode when we choose our own selfishness 
over the ways of God. When we let God define our lives, we move towards him in love. When we define our lives, we move towards ourselves in selfishness and ultimately hate. That's what it's getting at here when it talks about Babylon. And it has some interesting imagery tied with Babylon. It says that Babylon is drunk with her own immorality. Now, that's an intense image. Basically, that's pointing at what sin does. I mean, think about what happens when a person gets drunk. Their eyesight isn't clear. They can't very, very good decisions. They're just kind of stumbling to and fro. That's what happens when we choose selfishness over love. That's what happens when we take God out of the equation and decide to live our own best life. We're like a bunch of drunkards just slogging through life. The set of lenses through which we're supposed to see the world through God and Jesus and his love are dimmed. We've instead replaced it with a set of beer goggles where we think life is great, but in reality, we're just paving a path of destruction, destroying our families, the friends around us, shutting God out, throwing away his life of flourishing for a counterfeit of instant gratification that ultimately leaves us empty. And then it also uses this intense imagery of adultery, prostitution, of a whore, and things like that. That's very, very intense imagery. And what it is communicating here is it's using vivid, wild language to illustrate a point. And this is a point that is made throughout the whole entire Bible, and particularly in the Old Testament. And it's this idea of spiritual unfaithfulness. In the Old Testament, when Israel was straying away from God, it chose other things as its ultimate hope. It chose other gods. God would often say, look, I am a one person kind of man. I love lots of people, but they're supposed to only love me because I have what is best in mind for them. And when Israel and Judah would, would stray away from God, God would confront them because they were ultimately committing spiritual adultery. They made a covenant with God. They gave their lives to God. And yet, they cheat on him again and again and again, choosing other things as their source of ultimate hope rather than God. Look at what it says here in the book of Jeremiah as Jeremiah communicates this to Israel and Judah. She saw that I divorced faithless Israel because of her adultery, but that treacherous sister Judah had no fear, and now she too has left me and given herself over to prostitution. Intense imagery. But that is what is at stake here. When we decide to not go after God, when we decide to put our hope in ourselves, in our relationships, in politics, in money, in the economy, in the things of our lives, when we decide to do that, it's not just us being distracted with things. It's actually us saying, God, you're great, but I don't really want you to be my main squeeze. I don't really want you to be my main thing. You're okay, but these other things hold my attention more. They're prettier. They're better looking. They give me more pleasure in the moment. And we drift away from God, giving our hearts and our souls to other things. And that breaks the heart of God. And when we do that, we become Babylon, the city, the people that are after their own things rather than God. And we look at that and it should hurt our hearts that Jesus Christ, the one who came down and selflessly gave his life for us, can become second fiddle to these temporary things in the world. That should hurt our heart, but it should also lead us back to Jesus, that when we find ourselves being caught up in those things, we lay them at the foot of the cross and confess, God, I've messed up. I've pursued these things as my ultimate rather than you. Please forgive me. That's the beauty of the cross. That's the beauty of Jesus Christ. Look what it says here in the book of Mark. Jesus says this. He's coming and he's ministering to people who are hurting, people who have chosen all kinds of other things over him. And he's ministering to them. And the uppity religious leaders get very upset by this. And they start griping at Jesus. How dare you hang out with the prostitutes? How dare you hang out with the tax collectors? And Jesus tells them this. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, 
but those who know they are sinners. Jesus Christ knows that we are prone to wander. There's a beautiful song that says that. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to lead the God I love. Jesus knows that, and he still came to earth anyway to save you and to save me. How beautiful is that, that even though again and again and again we have run off with other things as our ultimate hope, Jesus still comes to earth to save us. This is illustrated at another part in the Bible, this story of a man named Hosea. Hosea was a prophet, and God decided to illustrate this this grand idea of how he continuously saves these unfaithful people through a man named Hosea. He asked Hosea, Hosea, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. And so Hosea did. He went and he married a prostitute named Gomer. And this woman, Gomer, she was around him for a little while. She had a very sullied history, a very rough life up to that point, made bad decisions. But Hosea still married her. And Gomer eventually went back to her old life. She left Hosea and went to live her old life, prostituting herself, spending night after night with man after man, leaving Hosea brokenhearted. And eventually... Gomer, the woman, she ended up in such a rough situation that she was actually sold into slavery. And we see this picture of her. It's like a like a slave trade is going on and people are selling them left and right. And it's like this image of her there in chains, chained up, showing how far she has fallen, how many bad decisions she has made. And Hosea, her husband, the one who had been left, the one who had been brokenhearted, the one who had obeyed God and was still suffering, he shows up and he buys Gomer's freedom. Even though she hurt him, even though she left him, even though she has broken his heart, he shows up and he purchases her freedom. That is a picture of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. Even though we've chosen thing after thing after thing over him, he shows up in the cross and lays down his life so that you will trust him as your ultimate hope, so that he will be your everything. How could that not drop us to our knees and make us devote our life to a Savior who loves us so much? Jesus Christ calls you to himself on behalf of love and the way he has expressed that beautiful, beautiful love. Jesus doesn't wait for us to get our act cleaned up before we come to him. Jesus offers us life and grace to us while we are still in Babylon. Not only living in Babylon, like we're living as like wonderful little monks in this broken city, even when we are whoring ourselves to the sin of this world, to other things as our ultimate hope, Jesus offers us life and grace. Jesus is offering you the opportunity to trust in him as your ultimate hope today. Isn't that beautiful? That we can be people who are in Babylon, but not of Babylon. We can be people who are maybe in a culture that is prone not to choosing Jesus, but we can choose Jesus and be a light to the culture around us because Jesus came into Babylon and rescued us when we were still living in the brokenness of the world. So Revelation 17 through 20 talks a little bit about Babylon, about what it looks like when we choose other things over God. And the other thing it communicates to us is that evil has a time limit. It talks about the destiny of evil. And the destiny of evil is ultimately destruction. One of the things it tells us in chapter 17 and in chapter 18 too is that evil has a time limit. In verse 10, it says he, the beast and the evil influences that work to distract people from Jesus, they will remain only for a little while says another spot in verse 17 that they, humanity, will give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. An image to say that humans are prone towards the deception of the devil. But it's only until the words of God are fulfilled. And then in chapter 18, three different times, it says, fallen is Babylon. Babylon will fall in one hour. Not a literal hour, but an hour to say that evil's time is limited, that evil will only exist for a certain amount of time. 
And it says in verse 14 that the reason for this is because Jesus Christ will ultimately overcome it. Together, they, the forces of evil, will go to war against the Lamb because the forces of evil, Babylon, the beasts, Satan, they represent everything that is anti-God. And they will eventually go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord above all lords and King above all kings, and his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. He calls us out of Babylon and to participate in the victory of the Lamb, because evil's time is limited. That's why the devil wants to distract people. That's why the devil tries to draw people away from Jesus, because evil's time is limited, and he knows it. Not only that, but this chapter 17 also tells us what evil eventually does to itself. Let's look at that. It's really interesting imagery here in Revelation 17, verse 16. The scarlet beast with the ten horns, the forces of the world the devil uses to distract people in Babylon, will eventually hate the prostitute. Evil will eventually turn in on itself because that's what evil does. Love gives evil and hate is inward focus. And eventually that inward focus turns in and destroys itself. It says the beast will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes. They will agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast. And so the words of God will be fulfilled. Evil's days are numbered and its destiny is destruction. Evil is designed in such a way that it takes and it takes and it takes until it destroys itself. God created a world that is meant to be self-giving rather than self-taking. And God will ultimately use evil to destroy itself. Such an interesting concept. Evil's time is limited. And evil will eventually destroy itself because that's what evil tends to do. We see this again and again and again in the way evil works itself into our lives. One of the things that evil does is it works its way into our lives and makes us our own worst enemy so that the devil can joyously see us turn on ourselves and make a wreck out of our life. I mean, think about what happens if we struggle with greed. We take money and money and money and money, and our money ends up being our downfall. Some of the people who are in the greatest amount of debt are the people who make the most amounts of money. If we let lust rule our lives, we will go after relationship after relationship after relationship until we just become hollow shells of who we want to be, never trusting another human being to love us. If we let anger control us. Ultimately, that leads us into lives of violence where we have no friends, sometimes can even end up with some jail time and things like that. Evil turns in on itself. And eventually evil will continue to destroy itself until Jesus finally wipes evil away with a final brushstroke. We need to remember that Jesus calls us to be in Babylon, but not of Babylon, that Jesus wants us to be a part of what he's doing, not what the evil influenced culture is doing. And he also wants us to know that it's tough some days, that evil can be overwhelming some days, that we don't always know what to do with it on some days, but evil's days are numbered. Keep holding on. Keep holding on and participating in the way of the Lamb, which is love and sacrifice so that we don't make messes of our lives. And then, as we move into chapter 19, we get this beautiful opportunity to see what the victory of the Lamb looks like. We're going to start in verse number 1 today. After John sees this image of evil turning in on itself, of what Babylon looks like, that evil's time is limited, he says, After this, I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting, Praise the Lord, salvation or rescue and glory and power belong to our God, the one who has called us into his victorious family. 
And then we skip to verse 11. And it says, then I saw heaven opened and a white horse was standing there. We get images of this beautiful picture like we saw at the beginning in the clip. It's a rider who was named faithful and true. The one who is faithful when we are not. The one who is true when we buy lies. The one who judges fairly and wages a righteous war. Jesus is the only one worthy of judging the world because he gave up his life. We aren't right to judge because we've defined right and wrong on our own. Jesus is righteous to judge because he gave up his very life and defeated the one thing none of us ever could, death itself. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head he had many crowns. The flames of fire represents that he sees everything clearly, that he is a judge. It is a sign that Jesus is the judge. And on his head, being many crowns means he is all-powerful ruler over everything. And a name was written on him that no one could understand except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven were dressed in their finest and pure white linens, and they followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. Intense imagery. The sharp sword from his mouth isn't literally coming out of his mouth. It's not like Jesus is a circus performer. The sharp sword is a symbol that Jesus is the righteous judge and he has the power to judge. That he rules not menacingly, not maniacally, but he rules with strength. And with justice, this idea of him releasing the wrath of God, that's intense imagery, imagery that sometimes makes us a little concerned. But the wrath of God is God's ultimate justice. And for those who are found in Jesus, the wrath of God passes over them. We actually ride with Jesus in this victory. But Jesus is righteously judging all of the evil in the world. And it says, on his robe and at his thigh was written the title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And eventually it says in verse 21, that all of the forces of evil show up to fight Jesus. And Jesus shows up all powerful, all mighty, all ready to judge evil once and for all. And it says that his evil stands there defiantly ready to take Jesus on their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came out of the mouth of the one who was riding the white horse. One fell swoop, and evil is completely and totally vanquished and defeated. We see this, and there's a couple things that we wonder. First, we wonder, how does Jesus take out evil with one fell swoop? The answer is the cross. Jesus won the ultimate victory over evil by dying on a cross. It was on this cross that he triumphed over evil completely and totally. How does Jesus win the battle? He shows up. Jesus is so powerful that all he does when he finally will defeat evil once and for all is show up and evil is done. That is how powerful Jesus is. His victory has been won on the cross and it will come to fulfillment on the day that he returns and he will wipe it out in one fell swoop. Notice how it said a few verses ago that Jesus shows up in a white robe dipped in blood. It's not the blood of his enemies. It's his own blood. And it is by his own blood that he shed on the cross that he actually defeated every force of evil that has ever existed. And from the time he died on the cross until the time he returns, he is offering so many people the opportunity to turn to him, to leave their ways of choosing Babylon and to choose him as he is looking towards the day that he ultimately returns and defeats evil in one fell swoop. Look what it says here in the book of Colossians about the cross. It says that Jesus actually disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle out of them, triumphing over them 
on the cross. We are prone to think that victory comes through overpowering people, through abusing people, through violence. But Jesus Christ turns all of the forces of the world and of the spiritual realm on their head by saying true power was actually gained by dying. True power was actually gained by laying myself down. True power was in love that is self-sacrificing, not power and abuse. And the victory of the Lamb over evil began in the cross, and it will come into a completion when Jesus shows up. He's so powerful that all he has to do is show up, and the forces of evil are destroyed instantly. Knowing that we serve such a powerful Savior, a Savior who is already working out his resurrection goodness, his cross power in our lives in the present, and he will bring it to completion at the time that he shows up, should give us hope. And it should give us hope that he invites us into that through that very same cross. So how does that impact our lives today? What does that do with our lives today? does a few things. First, it tells us that the lamb triumphs evil as a crucified conqueror, not as an abusive dictator, but as a crucified conqueror. And that should impact us in a few ways. First, it should tell us that we need to bring our brokenness to Jesus. Jesus saves the people who have chosen the ways of Babylon. He wants us to come to him and redefine our lives based on him. Maybe you're here today and you have never said yes to Jesus as your Savior and Lord, here's what I want to tell you. Jesus Christ doesn't want you to come to him out of fear. He doesn't want you to come to him based on, well, I got nothing better to do with my life. He wants the fact that he loves you so much that he gave up his life on a cross so that your brokenness could be redeemed. He wants that to be what changes your life today, and he is offering an opportunity for you to today. You just have to ask him to be the savior and Lord of your life. Come to him and say, Jesus, I've messed up. I've chosen other things as my ultimate over you. Be my savior and Lord. Forgive me of my sins and welcome me into your family. It says that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and forgives us and that we are brought into the family of God. Maybe that's you today. Maybe today you need to finally leave Babylon behind and choose Jesus so that you can become a minister of light in Babylon, in it, but not of it. The other thing is for us, maybe you, if you're a Christ follower, if you're not, Jesus wants you to bring your brokenness to him. When we mess up, Jesus wants us to come closer to him, not farther away from you. Some of you need to hear that today. You think you can't get to Jesus because you're so far off. You've chosen other things over him. You've chosen relationships. You've chosen money. You've chosen other things as your ultimate hope over Jesus. But Jesus Christ does not want you to run farther away from him as a result. He wants you to run to him like the story of the prodigal. When the prodigal son is far away, his father runs out to come and meet him. He doesn't want him to go. Surrender your brokenness to Jesus today, whether that's brokenness that's been done to you or whether that's the brokenness you have pursued over Jesus. Jesus wants you to come home. Give it to him today. The other thing I think it means for us is that knowing that the lamb has triumphed on the cross, knowing that the lamb's victory will come to completion in his return, means that we need to declare the victory of the Lamb in this broken world. Declare the victory of the Lamb in Babylon so people will turn to him. And it needs to happen through our words. Do we talk like the Lamb is one in the cross? Do we talk like the ultimate victory is going to be the Lamb's? It needs to happen in our actions. Do we live like the Lamb has won? Do our lives reflect the realities of Christ? Do our lives reflect the way that God has defined how we should live, self-sacrificing love? And does it happen in our thoughts too? When we're alone, what do we think about the most? Do we think about Jesus? Do we think about the King and King of Lord of Lords who has saved us? We need to bring our brokenness to Jesus. And we need to declare the victory of the Lamb because our great writer, Jesus Christ offers life and hope through his cross. 
which unites us with him. It's our duty to trust in his work, to live our lives in the present in light of what God has done in the cross and what he eventually will do on that final day when he vanquishes evil forever. Evil's days are numbered, but the crucified conqueror reigns forever. Father God, we come before you today. And God, we know that many, many times we've chosen our own ways over yours. We've chosen the ways of this world over yours, God, and we ask that you would forgive us for that. Father God, help us to realize that you want us to bring our brokenness before you, not run away from you today. God, I pray for any here who maybe this is their first time, they're deciding to choose you as Savior and Lord. Just pray a simple prayer. It could be as simple as, Jesus, be my Savior and Lord. Please forgive me for my sins. I want to know you. I want to give you my life. And I want to be a part of your family. It's a simple prayer, but when we mean it with our heart and everything that we are, it does an extraordinary work and transforms our lives. And we are brought into the kingdom of Jesus. We are safe and secure with him, no matter what happens in this world. Father God, we give you that today. Father God, we also ask that in everything that we do, our actions, our thoughts, and our words, that we declare your victory, the victory that has happened on the cross and the ultimate victory that is to come when you show up and defeat evil once and for all. Father, we give you everything that we are today. Transform us so that we can be in Babylon, but not of Babylon. We can be a source of light and your redemption in this broken world. We love you and we thank you, and it's in your holy and precious name that we pray today. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I pray that the hope of what Christ has accomplished on the cross and what he will accomplish when he returns transforms your life. Next week, we're going to be finishing up our series and we're going to look at what the perfect reality looks like after evil has been defeated. Jesus defeating evil isn't the end of the story. He calls us to live a life of perfection and flourishing with him. And that future hope is going to really, really impact your life. So make sure to join us next week as we get into that. It's going to be really beautiful and it's going to be an awesome time where we see what beautiful, good things God has in store for all of us. Be blessed, church, and we'll connect with you soon. Bye.